a call three years ago. We felt the call to come and pastor the church. And uh, I can tell you guys this now because I've been here for three years. But sometimes you come into a church thinking that you're the, the savior of the church, right? You, you can think like, okay, I'm going to do this and do this and do this. And uh, it's going to be wonderful things. Um, thank goodness I'm not the savior of this church. And Jesus is the savior of this church because the amazing things that I've gotten to experience is because he has worked through you guys so much. And I just appreciate you guys so much. You, uh, We have been so blessed being a, uh, leading this church and watching you guys grow and then you guys forcing me to grow. That has also been um, an important part of this and I couldn't be happier. This is, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting when you look at churches, there's a lot of times you have a church home, right? And my church home was Beach Lake Free Methodist Church for many, many years, even when I was planting a church, even when we lived in Connecticut, that was for 10 years after I attended there, that was my church home. Uh, it's no longer my church home. This is home to me. So I just thank you guys so much for uh, welcoming my family, loving my wife and kids, and honestly, uh, being the best church to pastor. Donna Molesky said something to me when I first got here. She said, this is the best group of people to pastor. And man, was she bright. So I just appreciate you guys so much. And uh, yeah, it's good to be appreciated too, right? I, I, that's, uh, that, that speaks a lot to my heart. And we are diving in to the I am statements in John again. We're going to look at Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. And with this statement, Jesus is using a metaphor, right? You know what metaphors are. It's describing something while comparing it to something else. And the amazing thing about a metaphor is it makes it concrete. It brings this theoretical idea down to us so that we can understand it. So if somebody came to me with an idea and they said, hey, I have this great idea. This is what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to do. And I listened to them and I said, hey, your idea is kind of like a house of cards. I'm saying that it's not a very sturdy idea, right? I, I think that your idea isn't very good. And you would pick that up from the metaphor, but it even goes deeper. You would probably feel pretty offended. It's not just me saying it's a bad idea. I'm saying, oh, that's a house of cards. And it brings a concreteness of my response. And your response might be, well, you have a heart of stone, right? And by you saying that to me, I would realize how cold I was being, how unfriendly I was being. We use metaphors all the time to help us better understand what other people are saying and really go deeper into our understanding. Now, I think it helps get truth into the soul. Metaphors help truth get into the soul. So Aristotle, who was a philosopher, a Greek philosopher uh, many years before Christ, he talked about the plainness of speech. He believed that all speech should be plain. We only say what we mean to each other, but he made an exception for metaphor. This is what he says. This is a quote from him. Ordinary words convey only what we already know. It is from metaphor that we can best get hold of something fresh. My prayer for you today is by learning about the Good Shepherd that you might get a fresh perspective of who God is, how he may lead you, how he cares about you, how he is devoted to you. The Bible is full of metaphors. If I said, God is my fortress. And I said that along with many songs who have said that. It's by saying that that I believe that God protects me. That even in the hard times that I have a protection 
with the Lord. If I say, God is my rock, well, guess what is great to stand on in the storm? A rock that doesn't blow away through the storm. And guess what? That idea comes down and hits me in the heart and hits me with a emotion. <coughs> God as a redeemer, that idea that God bought us back. He, we went away, we went towards sin, and he bought us back. He redeemed us like a person would redeem a slave. We are able to see the depths of his love. And that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that we understand as a church the emotional part of the gospel. The emotional part of the gospel that metaphor brings that God loves us and God cares for us and he wants us. And guess what he wants us to do? Follow him. God is shepherd, which is very common in the Old Testament. There's so many passages about God being a shepherd in the Old Testament. Means that he cares for you, that he's devoted to you, but also leadership, that he is going to lead you if you're willing to follow. And you know what I think? I think everybody wants a leader. They want somebody to lead them. Even the rebellious heart, even the wayward son wants to be led. Because here's what happens in a postmodern world. My truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. But what happens when I have a concept of truth and it doesn't work for me? Then I'm shifting my ideas of what is good and what is bad. And I am constantly shifting these ideas. And it doesn't feel great. Well, guess what? We have a God who gives us a concrete way to live. And a concrete way of a person to follow. And that is the good shepherd. We even see this with kids. Just let me show that kids thrive in structure. When there isn't structure for a kid, they will have difficulties knowing what is right and what is wrong, and they'll have struggles with it. But kids thrive in structure. And the good news of the gospel is that you can be led. And you can know that the direction that you are being led is the right direction. There's tons of times I'm going around and I'm wondering whether I'm going in the right direction. The only way that I can know that is by looking and seeing whether I'm following the good shepherd. And all this understanding, Jesus comes out to the scene and he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. He's taking leadership. He's taking the renewed people of Israel, a new people who can be established and have a new heart and relate to God and spread the kingdom of God through his leadership of being a good shepherd. A shepherd who cares, who leads, and who is devoted to his followers. As we've seen in this sermon series, and we've looked at the I Am statements, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the gate. All of these are I Am statements, but in the Greek, it's I, I am, which is ego, a me, which really means I really am. I am the completion of the shepherd idea. I am the fulfillment. Every time that the Old Testament talked about a shepherd, I am the true shepherd that fulfills all of these things. In each of these I am statements, and this one as well, we see that Jesus is telling what his nature is. He's not just a shepherd. He's not just some shepherd. He's the good shepherd. This is who God is. Through Jesus, who came to the world, is the exact representation of God. God in human form. And if we understand this, this can enrich our life transform our life. Man, I need a shepherd right now. Maybe you do as well. But if we understand these I am statements, we will better worship, 
We will better be and make disciples, and we will better connect to God. So we're going to spend time in John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18, and then we're also going to look at 25 through 30. So if you open up your Bibles to those spots, and we'll look at this, and we'll kind of see what Jesus may be trying to tell us through this passage. And like each of these passages, we'll look back to the Old Testament significance then look at Jesus' context, and then bring it to us today. So John, chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees a wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolves attack the flock and scatter it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Skipping to verse 27 in this dialogue with the Pharisees, Jesus answers, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who gives them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Just a powerful passage about the relationship of God and Jesus, and then, of course, the relationship of Jesus to his church. But I want to take a step back and look at the Old Testament significance of this. And the first point that you have is the festival of dedication. We talked last week about Jesus saying, I am the gate, which was right before this passage. The festival of dedication or Hanukkah, right? So the festival of dedication or Hanukkah was installed by Judas Maccabeus in a, a couple hundred years before Jesus came. And he rededicated the temple to God. Took out all the pagan stuff and began to purify the temple. Well, when Jesus comes onto the scene, he says, I am the temple. I am the new temple, and through me is the presence of God. And so by him saying, I am the shepherd, we now know how to encounter God through the good shepherd. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd. This is amazing. How in tune are sheep to the shepherd. They know the shepherd's voice. I wonder if we're this in tune with Jesus. Maybe uh, you've read books by a certain author, or maybe, uh, I'm sure you've heard me preach a whole bunch of times, what if I wrote a book? If you began to read that book, you would say, oh, I, I see Shane's voice in here. Because I'm used to listening to Shane, and this is what he says, and this is what he says. Well, 
in America, we have some famous authors that usually hire somebody else to write the books for them. It's called ghostwriting. And you can absolutely tell when somebody is ghostwriting because it's not their voice. So, do we know when Jesus is talking to us? To know the voice of Jesus, and the best way to do that is by reading the Bible, by seeking after God, by praying God, by worshiping God, by encountering Him through His Word, you will become so in tune with Him that you will recognize when it's not the Good Shepherd. You ever hear somebody say, well, God told me blank. God told me to tell you you're a crazy person. God told me to tell you uh, that you need to stop acting like this, stop acting like this. And you begin to wonder, ooh, that doesn't feel right, or I disagree with what they're saying right now. Well, the only way that you can do that is by knowing the shepherd's voice. When I hear people say some things, and it doesn't jive with my spirit, I begin to say, that doesn't sound like Jesus. That doesn't sound like a good shepherd. Particularly when people say, God hates a particular group of people. I'm like, that doesn't sound like the good shepherd. Now, don't get me wrong. Does God greatly dislike sin? Absolutely. Could he hate sin? Absolutely. The Bible actually says that. But the reason why he hates it is because what it does to people, if I sin, what it does to me, and what it does to other people as well. So yes, I'm not saying God can't hate things. He can be void of love towards horrific and terrible behavior. But does God hate groups of people? That doesn't sound like the good shepherd. That doesn't sound like the good shepherd. Sheep are amazing, right? So I want you to think of a sheep. You're probably not looking at that sheep and being like, now that, that's an intelligent animal, right? A sheep, they're very smart. They are just brilliant. We don't think of them as brilliant animals, but sheep have amazing cognitive ability. Sheep have amazing cognitive ability. They can recognize people. There's studies that show that they can recognize people. This is amazing. So Jesus calling us sheep, I know we don't like to be called sheep, but that's what we are. We are sheep following the shepherd. It doesn't mean that you have to be smart. It doesn't mean that you have to have special skills. No, you just got to recognize somebody. And that's Jesus, the good shepherd. Know who leads you. Know the good shepherd. The festival of dedication would have brought this up. That Jesus is the new dedication, the new shepherd. The next part is uh, that shepherds in the Old Testament were pretty prominent, right? So there were a lot of shepherds in the Old Testament. The first one is Abel, right? Cain kills Abel, and he was known as offering good sacrifices to God. So the first righteous person that we really find in the Bible is a shepherd. Then the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob, all shepherds. And in fact, when they went to Israel, that's what they were known for. They shepherd Pharaoh's sheep. Moses, <coughs> one of the greatest leaders in Israel, who through him, God led the Israelites out of Egypt was a shepherd. Of course, we know David. David, the shepherd king, the psalmist. And here's the thing. Shepherd shows this leadership idea. But it's even brought into the New Testament. Luke was at the nativity scene. When we move towards Christmas, they're shepherds. The shepherds there, they're the first ones that get to see the birth of the new king. Why is this important? 
Well, when we look at shepherds, we see good leaders. So, we, in a church, we have a pastor, which is a shepherd, right? This is a, just a French word for shepherd. And why is that? Why is, why do we call the leader of a church a pastor? Well, because leadership matters, but more important than that, caring, devoted leaders matter. Every single leader should be caring for the people. We've all seen leaders in the world who don't care about their followers. They just care about themselves. All they are thinking is, what can I get ahead? In fact, the world glorifies these leaders. It's all about them. Rule with an iron fist. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the best leaders are ones that care. It's the measure of a good leader. And so Israel and the church have honored men and women who lead with care, not with an iron fist. And this is because this is our God. Isaiah 40, verses 9 through 11 compares God to a shepherd, and this is what it says. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign God comes with power. And he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him. And his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lamb in his arms. And carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that, are, that have young. What a picture What a picture of God leading people through caring for them, holding them close to its heart. The picture I get here is, if you read this passage, you in no way get a weak leader. God comes in with power, with a mighty arm, and then he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. Which brings back the thought of the most famous psalm in all of Scripture. I know you guys have been thinking about it as I've been preaching about a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. That's the third point in the bulletin. Uh, Shepherds in the Old Testament is the second point. The third point is the Lord is my shepherd. And I'll just read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley the darkest valley. I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A psalm that has encouraged 3,000 years of darkness. 3,000 years of darkness. This psalm has been read to lift up the brokenhearted, to encourage those who feel like they're walking through a difficult time. 
And you know what sense I get from this passage? That the shepherd cares more for the sheep than the sheep cares for itself. That's your God. He cares more about you than you even care for yourself. So if you're here, you're feeling overwhelmed, you're questioning the direction in which God is bringing you, or you're dealing with certain unknowns. Maybe you just feel like the evil and the pain in the world is overbearing. Well, there's great news. The Lord can be your shepherd. David knew this deep discomfort. He was chased away by two other kings, by Saul and Absalom. He felt the terribleness of being in the dark places. Not only the dark places, but the dark places of the soul. But with this, he found peace because he knew that a shepherd cares for a sheep and we are God's sheep. Where does your strength come from? That's what this passage brings. It, it wants us to understand where we get our strength from. Gene Edwards, he wrote a book about brokenness focused on David, he, he asked this question, what does this world need? Gifted men, outwardly empowered, or broken men, inwardly transformed? I trust the person who says, the Lord is my shepherd. I trust the person that follows the good shepherd of Jesus no matter what they have experienced, no matter what brokenness that they have come to, that person who trusts in the Lord, those are the people that the world needs. But the verse ends in a particular way. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Where do you dwell? Do you dwell in your own strength? Do you lean on your own understanding? Or do you dwell in the house of the Lord? And guess what? Jesus, as the new temple, is where you need to dwell. You can not just dwell in God on Sunday mornings. No, you can dwell in God everywhere if you have faith in the good shepherd. So Jesus' context, the good shepherd, is that the care of Jesus for his sheep. Jesus cares about his sheep. He cares about you. He cares about me. Listen to Matthew 9, 36. It says this, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. It's a human condition to be to want to be cared for and loved. Don't listen to the lies that men don't need to be cared for or loved, or you just got to tough it up. You don't need to be cared about. You don't need to be loved. You can be a, a lone soldier in this world. No, everybody needs to know that they are cared for and loved. And the amazing thing about Jesus is he doesn't just talk about it. He doesn't just say, I love my sheep. No, he shows it. He tells a parable about a lost sheep that leaves the 99, and he chases after that one. No matter how far you have been away from Jesus, he demonstrates that he is a good shepherd. What I love about Jesus, what I think is so enticing about the gospel, is that God didn't just stay in heaven and say, this is how you should live, this is how you should live. No, the Shepherd comes down and lives among the sheep. And that's the next point. The shepherd who became a lamb. The shepherd who became a lamb. Oh, and if you would just go two slides, there's a, a picture of a lamb right here tied up, ready for the slaughter. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. 
The good shepherd lays down for the sheep. We've been talking about blood and the blood of the covenant. And the blood of the lamb. Mm. Yeah. Helpfully. This is Jesus' way of saying, You are His. You are his. That he laid down his life. That the shepherd, the shepherd became a lamb. Would you become a lamb? I don't think you would. I think that Jesus became a lamb. A lamb, a sacrifice for us. An amazing sacrifice. When Jesus comes to the world and he dwells among us, John sees Jesus and he says, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I will, God says, I will adopt you into my family. You will be my son or daughter through this lamb. So that he can save the other sheep. Will not perish, but have everlasting life. That by Jesus dying on the cross, by the shedding of his blood, the wolves, the thieves, they have no power anymore. Through that, Jesus has defeated death. He's defeated sin. They have no power on you. There is no victory on that side. It is only victory in Jesus. Revelation says we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and our, the words of our testimony about the blood of the Lamb. Maybe you've uh, seen people from India, right? They, uh, they play those like flutes and a snake comes out, right? I, listen, if you play with snakes, we, we learn in Genesis chapter 3, don't play with snakes, right? <laughs> and so if you're playing with snakes, you get what you deserve. And I've seen these, and I'm just like, you are not smart. Well, I learned something this week. They actually glue the snake's mouth shut. Now, even then, I would not play with the snake. But that is what Christ does to the thieves and the wolves. That's what Christ does to sin and death. The mouths are glued shut. It cannot hurt you. It cannot snatch you. By the blood of the shepherd, you are saved. You are brought into relationship, into the family of God. There's a common saying, God loves you just how you are. But he loves you too much to leave you there. He wants to bring you into a deeper relationship. He wants to lead you into a better relationship. Revelation 717 talks about this lamb being the shepherd. The lamb at the center of the throne, that is Jesus, will be our shepherd. And listen what it says, this eternal life. Springs of living water, he'll lead us to them. And he'll wipe every tear from our eyes. There's, there's a saying that there won't be crying in heaven. But we actually know that not to be true. There will be. But Jesus will be comforting us. That the tear won't fall. Because the God of the universe will wipe that tear before it ever falls. God as the shepherd cares so much about you. And so for us, I want us to remember something. How it applies to us, for us, you are loved by the good shepherd. John 10, 12 says, The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks and the flock, uh, the, attacks the flock, and scatters it. 
Do you know that you're loved by the Good Shepherd? That He doesn't view you as just another person. You are a son. You are His possession. He will fight for what is His. I want you to think about what you would fight for. So, we, we talk constantly about our safety plan when we're leaving the house. If the, if the house is on fire, what are we going to do? You know who I'm going to make sure is out of my house? My children. You know who is last on my list? My dog, right? Because my children are mine. My dog is mine, but is not as valuable to me. Hopefully, hopefully this will get a lot of views, Bobby, right? Because uh, yeah. then people will be like, oh, he's a terrible uh, person. But... I care about my children. And guess what? It's okay if you save your children before you save my children. Why? Because they're yours. But Jesus views you as his. You are a child of God. I think about my kids and when, they're, when they get teased or when they get made fun of. Man, I hurt with them. And that's how God loves you. He hurts with you when you go through the heart, uh, through pain and suffering and hurt. God feels it. You are loved by the Good Shepherd. I'll say, I'll say it again because you need to know this. You are loved by the Good Shepherd. That's a Amen. That's a Hallelujah. All right, so say, well, say it with me. You are loved by the Good Shepherd. You say amen. 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 Yes, this is good news indeed. But but let's uh, let's get to the unfun part because I don't love uh, I don't love to say at just the fun part that you're loved by the Good Shepherd. My question to you is: Are you following the Good Shepherd? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can talk about God's love to you a whole bunch. But if you're not following the good shepherd, you're not his sheep. John 10, 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. This dwelling, this following, this searching. Jesus is saying, I care about you so much. I am the good shepherd over you. But you need to follow me. So while we've been Focusing on the comfort and the love and the care for. What I also have to tell you is that a shepherd at this time, if there was a sheep that constantly went astray, the shepherd would break its back legs. And then, listen to this, it would pick up that sheep and put it on its back and carry it everywhere. So broken legs... It cannot walk, it cannot go astray, but who is it with all the time? When the legs heal, what happens to the sheep is that they never stray again. Maybe this is uncomfortable. Maybe this isn't how you view God. But I'm certainly not saying that God causes you into this terrible suffering because you're not following him. He certainly uses it. And sometimes. To get you to stay close. He makes sure. That you stay close. I've experienced this in my life. There's been times. Even as a pastor. Even as a Christian. That I began to stray away. Because you know what I thought. I know better than the good shepherd. I know what's good for me. I know what I need. And God has brought me back to draw me close, to humble me, so that I would never leave the side of the good shepherd. God's goal is not your happiness. God's goal is not your happiness. It's your devotion. God's goal is your devotion to Him. So sometimes we go through hard things, because the Good Shepherd wants us to stay close. The last point 
You could say, okay, I'm loved, I'm cared for, I'm going to stay close to God. But how does this apply to my life? For us, you are under shepherds. In the Diving Deeper this week, you will see Ezekiel 34. You can read that. But in that passage, God is yelling at the Israelite leaders because they're not being good shepherds. He condemns the bad leadership. You are called to shepherd it. Every single person is called to lead. It's called, you are called to shepherd. But not leading like the world, leading with care and devotion towards others. You are called to lead your circle. Maybe that's just your kids. That's fine. Maybe it's just at your workplace. Maybe it's your extended family. Maybe it's in a church. You might say, well, God can do it without me. I don't need to be an under-shepherd. I'll just remain a sheep. The amazing thing about Jesus is he comes down to help bring us up to lead others. People are who God works through. People are who God works through. People are plan A, and there's no plan B. Why? Because people were made for a relationship. And that's what this good shepherd is pointing us towards. Do you care about people? Do you care before you lead with an iron fist? Find hope in the good shepherd. Would you stand with me? As I pray us back in. May you may your heart wow. find the hope of the good shepherd. Lord, you are our shepherd. We lack nothing. Would we follow you like sheep follow a shepherd? We thank you for the good shepherd. For sending Jesus, who in the very nature of God became a human, to show our sheep how to find their peace and rest in you. Whatever we're going through, whether darkness, whether good, on this rainy day, may we not fear because we know you are with us. Would you dwell in our hearts? so that we may dwell in you for eternity. You are good. You are great. You are Yahweh. Amen.